It was George Bernard Shaw's view that England and America were two countries separated by the same language. During the interval, Fritz Spiegel tests this opinion and examines some of the consequences of America's linguistic mixture. When my uncle Willie emigrated to the United States from Austria in 1939, he resolutely refused to learn English. Let them learn German, he said. He died some 25 years later, a loyal and patriotic citizen who had sworn allegiance to the American flag and meant it too, but he still couldn't speak English. His children dreamed the American dream and duly prospered, and they of course did learn English, or what they think is English. Their father felt he was too old for new tricks and never got used to America. The children, on the other hand, who reveled in the opportunities they'd never had at home, said he was just another of those Bayunskis. Yes, Bayunskis, and this is the cue for my first translation. Immigrants who cannot get used to their new country tend to make unfavourable comparisons with the way things were at home, and such comparisons usually start with the words back home, or in German, bei uns, which is why they got the name Bayunskis. England also had its quota of refugees, but it was very small and rigidly enforced, which is why I'm here and my parents are not, but that's another story. Children, you see, were always welcomed here, but in the late 30s, free access was barred to adults. There were even fewer jobs to go around then than there are now, and in the process, it's not only jobs that were protected, but also the English language. But linguistic change is inexorable, and the German infiltration, instead of coming from the east through Dover or Harwich, took the indirect route, travelling via New York, Brooklyn and Los Angeles. The assault came a little later, but it came. So what you may now complain of as American diseased English may well have been literally and imperfectly translated by my cousins in order that my uncle would understand. At this point in time, zu diesem Zeitpunkt, Standpoint, Standpunkt, you know something, weißt du was? Have a nice day, you're welcome, okay by me, have a coffee, is it sugared? On a daily basis, ongoing situations, underlying reasons... I should be so lucky. All of them German in origin, not German-Jewish, mind you, but German. The familiar German reversed word order, that I must see, das muss ich sehen, careless he may be, but criminal he is not. Such contortions can now be heard coming out of even the most English of mouths. If you've been annoyed, write by some inarticulate speaker, often from the radical left, right? punctuating every phrase, every sentence, right, with that aggressive but rhetorical request for agreement, right, then blame the Germans, nicht? They've been suffering from that nervous tick for years, nicht? And I assure you, it's just as silly and annoying in that language as it is in English, nicht? Where many English speakers now tend to interlard ordinary statements with in terms of, where of or about would do, I'm thinking in terms of money, I think in terms of the equally superfluous German Beziehungsweise. The same probably applies, if you like, to the frequent slipping in, if you like, of if you like. Well, I don't like. I like even less the now even more fashionable and also German-inspired adverbial opener. In German, it's common to start a sentence with throwaway adverbs, such as hoffentlich, hopefully. But hopefully has two forms in German. Hoffentlich, I hope, and Hoffnungsvoll, full of hope. English makes do with hopefully for both meanings, so you never know who is doing the hoping. Moreover, the German hoffentlich takes no comma, whereas the English hopefully seems to demand one, and this natural break has made the adverbial opener a favourite with impromptu speakers who perhaps need time to think, but who feel that they must make some kind of noise to signal that they are about to say something, and hopefully has been joined by a host of clumsy adverbial openers from arguably all the way down the alphabet. But I'll stop at B. B for basically. Basically is also an I am about to speak noise that is threatening to oust the Englishman's time honoured well, and it often reinforces it as well, basically. 
If the basically cunt is now inordinately high on radio and television, with its preponderance of chat shows and instant expert interviews, it's nothing to all the other adverb starters used by newspaper journalists. I suspect they wind a piece of blank paper into their typewriter, tap out a random adverb, add a comma, and then wait for further inspiration. They even manage to invent adverbs such as reportedly, a word that until recently simply did not exist either in English or American. If the book of Genesis were ever to be subbed or sub-edited for newspaper serialization in America or here, it would read, Initially, God created the heaven and the earth. Basically, the earth was without form and void. Noticeably, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Reportedly, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Loftily, God said, let there be light, and predictably, there was light. Brilliantly, God called the light day, and additionally, the darkness he called night. Curiously, God created man in terms of his own image, and so on, all the way down to the seventh day, when, thankfully, God saw everything that he had made, and, interestingly, it was good. But before I get carried away, it's as well to remember that long before my continental cousins embarked on their insidious modification of American English, the translators of Saints Matthew, Mark and John showed an over-fondness for adverbially opening chapter and verse. I lost count at about a hundred verses, beginning with such admonitions as, Verily I say unto ye, so let him who is without adverbial sin cast the first stone. Nevertheless, I maintain that basically is the greatest continental American blight the country has suffered since Dutch elm disease. Giving the English language to Americans is like giving sex to small children. They know it's important, but they don't know what the hell to do with it. That was said by a wise American, the writer Morton Cooper, and it must be stressed that complaining about Americanisms and the sloppy speech so characteristic of the relaxed, laid-back American has been a favourite pastime among the more aware Americans far longer than it has been here. After all, they would have noticed them first. So it would be absurd to condemn all Americans out of hand. I recall an anecdote about that great American lexicographer, Noah Webster, 1758 to 1843. According to this, his wife one day unexpectedly entered the study where he was supposed to be compiling his monumental dictionary, only to find him in the arms of their housemaid. Mr. Webster, she said, I am surprised. Webster drew himself up and replied with all the dignity he could muster under the circumstances, No, my dear, we are surprised. You are astonished. But before long, of course, subsequent editions of Webster's Dictionary duly accepted, surprised, in the way Mrs. Webster is supposed to have misused it. Farmer's Dictionary of Americanisms of 1889, which belongs to my favourite kind in that he not only records and defines words, but also makes judgments and comments, Farmer's complains of smart being used in the sense of cleverness and cunning, instead of its only correct application, which is, of course, to a man's attire as in a smart suit. Scientist, a man of science, he grudgingly accepts as a working member of the SUWP, the Society of Uncouth Words and Phrases. Bone setter for a surgeon or doctor appalled him. And Farmer also derides interment for a funeral or burial and casket for a coffin. I wonder what he would have made of the now so common shrink, short for the facetious head shrinker, or of tree surgeon for a man who, however learnedly, scientifically or painlessly, still merely fells or prunes trees. But again, it's a brave man who condemns as modern usage such a pretentious euphemism. Shakespeare did it too. He may not have known about a tree surgeon, but his cobbler in Julius Caesar claimed to be a shoe surgeon. I am indeed, sir, he says in Act I, a surgeon to old shoes. As most people know, many words one thinks of as typically American, such as gotten, are, of course, simply old English ones that have been preserved in exile, just as Yiddish is based largely on medieval German pronunciation, which survived in ghettos all over the world. 
Pinky, an American's little finger or toe, is not the facetious baby word it sounds like, but a medieval English endearment, pinkney or pigsney, meaning little one, probably also related to piccaninny. Moonshine is more than a hundred years older than the American prohibition. It's white brandy smuggled on the coasts of Kent and Sussex. Take the word fall. Anyone who's seen the colours of the New England countryside in September will find the French-based word autumn infinitely inferior to the old English fall of the leaf. Grouching, in the sense of complaining, indelibly associated now with Groucho Marx, sounds totally American, but was in fact used by Chaucer in The Wife of Bath, in the same sense, though not in the same spelling. But far more characteristic of a vital language like American is the constant coining of new words, which are often both inventive and imaginative. Can you think of a better word than commuter? Or for a traffic tailback, which is surely to be preferred to the ugly Q? Or a traffic snarl-up, based as it is on an old English word for a tangled mess? Who would have thought ten years ago that the simple word gate, used as a suffix, would indicate scandal, corruption and public embarrassment. After Watergate, we had Oilgate, Muldergate and even Billygate, from ex-President Carter's younger brother. American militant blacks, and there's a whole treatise to be written in that particular linguistic field, they call some of their less proud brethren Oreos. A Creole word, perhaps? No, to understand the term, one has to be told that an Oreo is a kind of biscuit consisting of two dark-coloured, chocolate-flavoured layers separated by a white, creamy filling. Hence this term of brotherly abuse aimed at those who are considered black outside but white within. Among many other useful black contributions to the language is the in suffix, starting with the famous protest sit-ins at racially segregated premises in the early 1960s and leading to love-ins, work-ins, sleep-ins and even be-ins. They came from black jazz musicians' slang for playing as a guest or sitting in with a band that's not one's own. On the negative side, however, White people may resent the implication that the possession of soul is something they can never aspire to. And even more negative is what is now known as Hague speak, which is a direct descendant of the Germans' predilection for long and largely meaningless words. A certain amount of annoyance or confusion can be caused to Britons when Americans take a perfectly good English word and change its meaning, momentarily in English has long settled down to the accepted meaning for a moment, not in a moment. English air travellers have been known to be alarmed by an American captain's announcement, we shall be in the air momentarily for New York. Momentarily seems to be going the way of presently, which now still means soon, but which will presently come to be synonymous with now. As for the American overly, I can see no improvement in it on over. Through, instead of until, has a certain kind of logic to it. Monday till Friday could mean that the period stated ends as Friday begins, whereas Monday through Friday means right through the whole of Friday. But then again, a book title like English Composer's Elgar Through Tippet sounds uncomfortable in English, as does the American newspaper headline Tippet Opera Slated in Boston, which means a projected performance, chalked up, as it were, on a slate, not one slated by the critics. There is also that less admirable slovenliness by which Americans obliterate the difference between words. In British English, imply and infer are, in a sense, opposites. One man may make an implication from which another may draw an inference. Americans make do with infer for both. They, of all people, fail to distinguish between emigrate and immigrate, using the latter for both those who come and those who go. And, of course, there are all those well-known areas of transatlantic confusions by which, for example, a member of the Black Dyke Band on tour in the United States may have some explaining to do about the kind of musicians his band employs. He would be ill-advised to ask for a fag when he meant a cigarette, or for a rubber when he meant an eraser, and should take care to describe his ailing grandmother as bedfast, not, on any account, as bedridden. If asked to someone's shower in America, he might be tempted to take a towel, 
but would be more welcome if he brought a present. I was once fortunate to witness the astonishment on the face of an American hotel receptionist as a rosy-cheeked young Lancashire lass, a violinist with the Halle Orchestra, asked him to knock her up at half-past seven. Though she would doubtless have known that her G-string, a stock-in-trade to every fiddle player, would have had a different connotation to him. And incidentally, the G-string, as first worn by American female dancers, has nothing to do with the fourth or lowest string on the violin. It should really be G-string, G-double-E, which was a kind of small loincloth worn by American Indian boys and men. And while I'm on the subject of music, the American half notes, quarter notes, eighths, sixteenths, etc. notes are straight translations from the German, and for reasons of accuracy and convenience alone are far preferable to the English minims right up to the last semi demi hemi semi demi semi quiver. On the debit side, the Americans must have caused untold fiscal chaos with their billion, which is not two, but a thousand millions, but which Europeans call a milliard. An American trillion is the third power of a million or a million billions, that is, millions of billions, but in France it is a thousand billions or one English billion, if you still follow me. If you don't, let me just pass on the information that this absurd method of counting, which goes up to quadrillions, octillions and zillions, is even older than the discovery of America itself and certainly goes back to Chaucer. At present, some people use the American billion, some the European and eventually, no doubt, the American meaning will prevail as they've got more money than the rest of us. The whole subject of the American difference is a source of endless fascination to ordinary word lovers, idle browsers like me, with no linguistic, philosophical, social or ethnic axe to grind. As every lover of reference books knows, one of their greatest delights lies in the happy accident rather than the single-minded search undertaken by the professional. For example, out of sheer boredom with constant news items about confrontation, militancy and brotherly inter-union abuse, I looked up the word blackleg in various dictionaries. One who disregards his trade union's call to strike was the general tenor of the definitions. The Oxford English Dictionary records an early use of 1865, a local name of opprobrium for a workman willing to work for a master whose men are on strike but it does not connect that term with blackleg, a disease in cattle and sheep, which, I suppose, would probably result in the animals shunning the stricken member of their herd, as animals do. Scab, another favourite word for shouting outside factory gates, has been a term of abuse for as long as people have suffered from scabs or scabies and been made outcasts on that account. Americans prefer scabs to blacklegs, in the strike-breaking sense, and probably coined it in that application in 1806. They also use fink for our blackleg, which goes back to the famous homestead strike in 1892, which helped to lay the foundations of American trade unionism. That sent me to a German dictionary of slang, from which I discovered that the word fink, which means finch, the bird, was, in 19th century university slang, used to deride a student who refused to join any of the traditional fellowships or students' unions whose main objectives were carousing and dueling. And from that, surely, comes the American word fink, defined as a treacherous or despised person. But then I thought, why rat fink? Well, back to the OED. A rat, in about 1850, was the American word for a printer not approved by his trade union, one who consents to a lower wage than his fellows. And such an anti-closed shop establishment was known as a rat office. And if all that were not sufficient reward for a casual browser, I found myself with two more delightful bonuses, both faintly ornithological. In the 19th century, a cock-robin shop was the name for a small printing office where cheap and nasty work is done and low wages are paid. And even more fortuitous, the discovery that the German embassy in London once had on its staff a Herr Fink, who was especially popular when introduced to his American counterparts. He was a counsellor, Rat in German, and would therefore have been introduced as Herr Rat Fink. Have a nice day. 
Guten Tag. That was Herr Fritz Spiegel.